Okay, so hello and welcome to the SCD Committee on University and Student Programs webinar series. Uh, today we'll have a panel discussion on the future of exploration geophysics. My name is Joan Blanco and along with Aurelian Hoser, we'll be moderating the event today. Uh, the discussion will be followed by a question and answer session from the audience. If you want to submit a question, please use the Q&A button uh, below. Uh, this event will be recorded and then will be uploaded in YouTube. So why are we here today? Uh, in the face of fluctuating oil prices and the COVID-19 pandemic, geophysics is facing serious change. As geophysicists, we have to deal with those new challenges and also the new opportunities that come with the challenge. And we have, myself, some questions. We wonder what will the future of geophysics look like and where and how we'll be able to work. What skills do we need to have to be competitive and have a successful career? And to answer these and even more questions, we have gathered a panel of five distinguished speakers who will share their experience and opinions from various perspectives of industry experts, university professors, and emerging professionals. Our panelists are Peter Duncan from Microseismic Inc., Manika Prasad from Colorado School of Mines, Anna Donche from EIT Raw Materials, Vinicius Rigetsch from EcoPetrol, and Claude Trantham, formerly with ExxonMobil. Additionally, we welcome Linda Ford from the Society of Exploration Geophysicists, who completes the panel and will listen to the panelists' responses and your questions so that your thoughts and your opinions can help Linda and SEG staff in managing SEG programs specially designed for you. To begin with, we would like to give our panelists the opportunity to shortly introduce themselves. And additionally, please share with us what is your background and what is your current professional occupation. And apart from this, um, how do you find yourself? What gets you out of bed in the morning? And I would like to, uh, Peter, start. After he has turned on his microphone. Yes, I okay. must do that. Sorry. My name is Peter Duncan. I currently live in Houston, Texas. Um, I am with Microseismic Inc., although I am currently furloughed, as are most of my employees as a result of COVID. And so I am enjoying my a lot of time at home, although I'm probably working harder than ever trying to get us back on the ground. The, uh, the stuff that was sent out said, how would you describe yourself in one word? And I think I'd say energetic. Most people uh, around me call me the energizer bunny because I seem to be running everywhere and doing everything all the time. Uh, describing myself in one sentence, I, I'd say I like to figure things out. That's been, and it doesn't matter whether it's uh, uh, how to run a meeting, how to fix a radio, how to run a geophysical program, how to uh, make a background in my computer or run a company. I enjoy figuring things out. Uh, I've, had, um, I've had corporate analysts or, or coaches tell me, that's great, except you only like to do everything once, Peter. And once you've done it once, you're then bored and move on. Perhaps that's part of the energy thing. Um, so that's me. Uh, and the, the question said, how has the coronavirus changed? Well, I'm in my office today, but it's only the second time in three months. Thank you very much. Manika? Hello, my name is Manika Prasad and I am a professor of geophysics at Colorado School of Mines. That's sort of the dry part of what I, my job description. I like to call myself as a rock squeezer. I have strength to squeeze rocks with my bare hands. Now, most probably I would say I'm a rock geezer more than anything else. Um, I let students squeeze the rocks. Um, on a more serious note, what we do is um, we uh, look at uh, um, studying rock fluid interactions and we provide calibration data for remote quantification and this can be for anything, this can be for energy, this can be for uh, contamination transport or for CO2 sequestration. Um, the, the part that gets me out of bed is just exactly what Peter said. The the knowledge that we have to be able to go in a lab or in any environment and look at a problem and say, yeah, maybe 
I can look at it in a way that provides a solution. So that's what drives me out of bed to see you can you can work on anything. The technical skills that we have allow us to pull apart a problem and work on that problem to identify a problem. And I think we can find problems given the way we work. I think we can find problems even by looking at a mirror. So, so I think that's what really drives me out of bed is just the fascination of how things work and trying to figure out things how, how, how to uh, understand and describe them. Now, the, with the pandemic with COVID-19, I have started defining things as AC and BC. BC is before Corona, AC is after Corona. So before Corona, what, uh, for me, the biggest change in my career was the realization of um, discrimination. And that it happens at every stage of life and to everyone. We all experience it. And the, there will be always people who try to derail us from our goals, deny access, deny funds, deny whatever, because their agenda is different from ours. And what I've found, the biggest change in my career has been to not be distracted by fighting their fights, but to stay true to my goals, my scientific or professional goals. What the pandemic has taught me and how things will change is we will have to be more efficient. We will have to be efficient because, like Peter said, he's one day in his office. I have not been in my office since three months. but. We are doing things by Zoom. I'm talking to my students. We connect. We, we discuss papers. We discuss what they're doing. Uh, one of my students is getting a GoPro so that I can look at his experiment and guide him from far. And so we'll have to be more efficient in what we do. Uh, the other thing which I think has to change is given the disparity in pandemic efforts based on socioeconomic factors we will have to become more accepting and more training excellence and dependent on excellence in others. Um, so I'm thinking that this will allow us for a better and freer sharing of knowledge, not just silos of knowledge, but a more broader scale knowledge sharing. So that's pretty much uh, uh, in a short form and the answers to what you had Thank you. Thank you, wonderful. Anna? Hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Anna Donchev. Uh, I'm originally from Poland, right now based in Berlin at EAT Roma Trios. Uh, so with my background, so I got a degree in geophysics. So I think that's something that uh, connects me with you all. And I've been also involved with SEG for the past six years, uh, very actively as a student and also uh, last year as a one member of the committee uh, here at CUSP. So I really also am grateful for, for this invitation for SEG. And uh, I also had a degree uh, after my bachelor in geophysics. I actually changed my career slightly. So I studied sustainable and natural resource management. So I went a bit broader to actually discover the, this whole raw materials value chain and get this bigger perspective, which I think also representing the millennials, sorry, it's also something that we are, as a young people are looking for, the sustainability issues, um, tackling climate change and, and having this bigger picture, what we as a geoscientist can do. Um, so right now, uh, as I said, I'm working as an EAT raw materials, but um, there was a question, um, what happened uh, with the pre-post-COVID um, uh, career? So for me, I actually started my job uh, at this position as a master education manager here at EH Raw Materials in January. So I was working in the office with my colleagues only for one month. Uh, and after that, I immediately work um, as I started working from home. So that is, I think, a big change. Uh, and I think later on, um, when we come to the career section and answering the question, maybe I, I can also give some tips uh, for uh, young professionals how to adapt to this, uh, to this COVID response as well. Uh, but for me, what was the biggest challenge and the biggest change in the career is that um, I choose a slightly different path than, than um, scientific or industry. I decided to actually um, help out the other students 
so with the student activities. Um, this is also uh, partly because of so many years of involvement in SCG. So I chose to help students at the master programs with the student activities and the student programs. Um, and this, of course, for me is a challenge right now because all our programs or our activities are physical ones. Uh, we have a great um, two weeks challenge based programs for, for students traveling across Europe. And unfortunately, those programs cannot go ahead as planned because um, now the travel is restricted. But I also, what I saw uh, with this COVID challenge is that it also brings a lot of opportunities. So we are trying now to virtualize a lot of things, uh, a lot of events to connect, to still connect people and still give those opportunities and activities and learning um, activities to, to the students. So, so I think I see it also as a big opportunity for the industry, for um, nonprofit organizations to still connect people and uh, also what, what SEG is right do, doing right now. So to connect uh, people virtually as we cannot go and meet physically. And so there was also one question which, which says, um, yes, how can you define yourself in one word? I would also say curious. And I'm happy to see that there is a lot of curious people here, um, always curious about the word um, traveling. Of course, we cannot travel right now. And um, maybe one um, random fact. So I did this international masters also at EAT Raw Materials uh, for the past two years. And I counted that for the past three years, I was living in nine or 10 different apartments in four different countries. So I think this curiosity about the world and being able to adapt to the constantly challenging environment is also helping me uh, coping with this COVID situation. Thank you very much, Vinicius. Hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank very much SCG and all the uh, all the people involved in, in organizing this meeting for the invitation. Um, talking a little bit about myself, my name is Vinicius Higuchi. I'm currently living and working in Rio de Janeiro, which is the city right here in the background that all of you can see. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm working in the pre-south of uh, Campos and Santos Basin in Brazil uh, with Ecopetrol, which is the Colombia operator. And I have graduated from university two years ago. Uh, so 2018, where I, I graduated uh, in geology, but actually I've been involved with SEG for the past five years. Um, and, that's, and that's pretty much about the, the career right now. Um, what, what, when I graduated, I started working in Halliburton, and then uh, I was in, interned there, and then I, I, I was hired. I, I stayed there for one year, and then I changed it to, to, to Echo Patrol. And I think that was the biggest change actually in my career <laughs> since it's not such a, a long one. Um, the question about the pandemic and what gets me out of bed, I think, of course, everything changed. I'm, uh, for three months now, I'm, I'm working at home and, and thanks to the, to the digital transformation, I'm, I'm can, I can work really, really fine. Uh, but what gets me out of bed, I think there are so many things that, as an exploration geoscientist. There are so many things to discover, and I think being part of, of, of the, 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 the people in the industry that can discover something new is, is really uh, motivated. So that's, that's it. Thank you very much. And Cloud? Well, I'm going to go backwards on the questions. What gets me out of bed in the morning is the sun. I'm very photosensitive. So. If it's winter, I don't wake up till 10. And if it's summer like now, I get up about six. So um, that's easy. COVID, uh, I retired three years ago. So that was very good practice for COVID. Uh, I do miss all the social activities. My wife and I are big supporters of Rice University. And uh, so all of our sports got canceled. All of our social things got canceled. And uh, some of my other social stuff is gone. So I do a lot of webinars these days. So let me say a little bit about myself. I'm a kind of odd, although Peter might come from this background too. I did not study geophysics. I studied physics uh, at Rice University and before that at the University of Arkansas. Uh, in fact, I did biophysics. Um, so when I was looking for a job in 1980, the only companies that were hiring anyone because it was a recession, you probably never heard of that, there were recessions in the past too. And, um, oil companies are hiring. So I thought, I'll take a temporary job with these guys. They offer a pretty good salary. So I went to work for Exxon um, and ended up working for Exxon Mobil for 36 years. Uh, pretty good career. I started in seismic data processing, 
went to research after that, uh, had a couple of foreign assignments, uh, and I popped back and forth between research, which was mostly writing uh, programs for uh, signal processing, um, and also managed a lot of projects with contractors. Uh, that was one thing I always hated doing at the beginning, but I got pretty good at it later on, especially 4D projects. So um, I guess that's, that's enough. Let's take some questions. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Linda. Thank you, Aurelian. Um, I'm Linda Ford. I'm the managing director of SEG programs uh, located here in Tulsa. Um, I have a background in higher education administration. I've actually done some graduate work in counseling. Um, and my um, other area of career work has been in grant program management. Uh, for me, I think one word to describe me would be resilient. I've had some things that have kind of um, blocked my path and I've had to find a way to reinvent myself or reinvent my career and uh, keep managing to bounce back in spite of the obstacles that, that come my way. So I think resilient is probably a word to describe me. Uh, one of my biggest changes was from uh, uh, doing higher education administration to association management. Um, kind of reached the end of a career path in higher ed administration and uh, had already come up against some obstacles in, in that area. I uh, worked at one institution early in my career where um, it was uh, made very clear to me that as a woman, I would not be able to advance any further than I was, and I was on a fairly entry-level position. And so I, I shifted gears, went to another institution, uh, and continued my career in higher education administration. Um, and, and it just uh, kind of bumped up against the reality that, um, Higher education in the U.S. is uh, experiencing a lot of difficulties and challenges these days. And again, uh, the opportunities to uh, advance for me were becoming limited. And uh, especially in the location where I am, because my partner uh, is a chef here and we have an, a restaurant in the area, we didn't want to move. And so uh, the opportunities for me to move to a different organization and stay in my field were not uh, wide open to me. Uh, but, uh, and I had no idea what I was going to do uh, with the skills that I had. And fortunately, in a conversation with a friend of mine, discovered that uh, the skills that I had and the experience I had in higher ed would translate uh, quite well in association management. And so I joined SEG about six years ago. Um, what gets me out of bed in the morning and how has the pandemic changed things? Well, I think for me, I have an absolute fascination with the science of geophysics. Um, and that gets me out of bed in the morning to go to work and, and do the things that I do with uh, all the geophysicists that I work with and helping uh, resource and provide training and educational opportunities for them. I think if I'd known anything about geophysics when I was in high school, I probably would have taken a very different career path. I actually was a chemistry major in college, um, but could easily have been sold on geophysics at that time uh, because uh, really what I was looking for was applied math, something to to uh, take the interest in math and apply it. Um, how the pandemic has changed things, I've been working from home uh, for the, um, about three months now. And I think that what we observed immediately with the pandemic was that the window was wide open to help sell folks on uh, the effectiveness of virtual training and collaboration opportunities. And I think that that's probably here to stay. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a, there's still a place for face-to-face uh, -face meetings, but I think um, there's some great opportunities that virtual digital platforms offer us. And so I'm excited about finding those opportunities for CG. 
Thank you very much, um, uh, John Marine. I want to go off course for a second because I um, yeah, haven't heard somebody who's also seen here on the panel um, and I would like to give the opportunity to Catherine Elkin to also talk about Catherine's like the good soul behind SEG student programs and SEG student chapters. Catherine, would you like to say something? Sure, I won't, I won't be long because I'm ready to listen to everybody. Um, so I'm Catherine Elkins and I work with the student programs of SEG. I've been with SEG for three years now. Um, so if you email anything about uh, any of our grant programs, our travel grant programs, uh, most likely you're going to be hearing from me. Uh, I'm glad to answer all the emails that we get and, and put all the information on our website. Um, my background is I was a science education teacher. Um, I got a master's in environmental science. And uh, when I, my time was up in teaching in public schools, I uh, happened to come across this position, this wonderful position um, that's been a great fit ever since I've been there. And I really enjoy working with our students and all our student chapters all around the world. And I welcome everybody who's joined this webinar. It's very exciting. And I hope you'll join for the future webinars. Thanks, Aurelian. Thank you very much. Before we go into the engaging discussion. I just want to make a comment because we're looking at the Q&A section in the chat. Um, our plan is to have another 50 to 70 minutes of panel discussion and afterwards we will have some time for your questions which you can then post in the Q&A section or if you're brave enough you can virtually raise your hand and we can grant your permission to also to speak. Um, please, you can already ask your questions but um, stay with us for another hour or so then we're coming to your questions. So we've talked a lot about the, our history, our backgrounds, and the current situation, but actually the title of this event is called The Future of Exploration Geophysics. Therefore, we want to talk about the future, what are the opportunities, perspectives, and um, before we can actually engage in, this, in a career in the ge uh, geophysics, we have to go to university and study. Therefore, we first want to talk about education. And we want to hear from our panelists uh, what they think, what the basic competences of a student or emerging professional comes to finishing university, applying for a job in the industry and academia should be. And um, how do you envision the geophysicists of the future? What are what is the perfect um, applicant for a job? And please don't say like 30 years of experience and 20 years of age. So now questions are open for everybody and then we will see um, how the discussion is going on. I, I think, uh, are you uh, just expecting us to jump in or? Uh, yes. Okay, okay. I guess given the silence, I'll jump in because uh, faculty abhor silence. And so, so I would say that uh, the key motivation factors for students to pursue a career in geophysics, I think it would be relevance of what is happening. And I have more faith in the new generation uh, of bud budding geophysicists that uh, you will influence how we interact with the Earth and our, our environment. I think uh, what has been the major changes that I've seen in the university have been driven a lot by student interest. We find more and more students coming to us and saying, well, oil and gas is nice, it pays us uh, uh, pays a, a, a nice salary, but we want to go uh, perhaps in oil and gas, but we want to find a more equitable and a more socially responsible, uh, environmentally responsible way of uh, uh, pursuing our careers. So what I'm finding is, regardless of what we're doing, whether we're doing sustainable energy, whether we're doing environmental uh, geophysics, or we're doing oil energy geophysics, we are all moving more and more towards a socially environmentally responsible way to uh, 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 have an education in geophysics. So I think that will be uh, also in future key motivation factors. So, so Aurelian, there's a question here in the Q&A section from Sergio Garcia, which I'll boil down to is, you know, how is exploration for oil and gas consistent with uh, zero emissions targets and the environmental concerns about greenhouse gases? So I'll answer that because I was an early believer in global climate change. And um, 
we have to get away f- from those things, but that's not going to be very quick. You can't just say, let's cut it off. Uh, that's like removing all your funding and saying, now become a fit more efficient. Uh, we have to do a gradual transition from one to the other. And that's, that's going on right now, partly driven by economics. But I think in the long run, um, we, there's nothing wrong with renewables. They're, they will be the future. Renewables and uh, nearly unlimited things like hydrogen fusion uh, should be the future for all of us. But in the meantime, for who knows how long, we still need to find oil and gas. And don't forget, it's not just for energy. There are other uses for oil and petroleum products. And the last part of the question was, what's the stance of energy companies on this? They're all different. Um, Some of them are investing in renewables. Uh, Some of them, like uh, my alma mater, ExxonMobil, are investing in um, uh, biologically generated fuels and things like that. But uh, like I said, there's not a consistent uh, view in the industry, although I think there aren't many deniers of climate change anymore. So if uh, returning to education, really, the, the second question you put in that is what motivates someone to become a geophysicist or what should or what I would relate to it. And I'll tell you that what motivated me, I was 17 years old and I went to work after first year as a geologist, geology student to work in, the, in Newfoundland on a copper drilling project. And I got attached as the gopher to a geophysicist who was doing an IP survey the guy was classically educated belgian and every evening out in the bush he would showed me how to take the equipment apart how to reduce the data and how to interpret it in terms of what i was seeing in the earth and i thought my word here's a career opportunity to be out in nature to be treasure hunting to be using really neat kit to have a little bit of math and to be solving problems day in and day out i went back to university for second year, and then we're talking now, back in 1970, so it's a long time ago, and I said to the head of the department, I want to be a geophysicist. So they designed a program for me, and the part of the question was, what do you need to, what does the university need to teach you? And they need to teach you the basics to think, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't consider education pouring stuff in, I consider education being drawing out from you. They need to draw out from you the ability to think through a problem in physical ways. Now, some people got more mathematical talents to approach that. They should concentrate it on. I'm not a mathematician. Some people are more insightful, draw pictures and think through things. That's kind of more the way I am. But it's this process of being curious and working through a problem, knowing the fundamentals of mechanics and electromagnetics and math so that you don't make a silly mistake. But and knowing geology, you have to know the basics of geology to be a geophysicist. We are a subdiscipline of geology. For the future, for the modern geophysicist, you need to know some inverse theory, statistics, the kind of stuff they call data analysis these days. And you know, you're going to need to program. I was taught what for and Fortran for, and I can't program anything now. People use Python and other things that are way beyond me. Um, but It's important, you students out there, that you keep your programming skills up. And then there's one more thing that I think, well, two things I'll add to it. One, I don't believe it's the job of the universities to teach you to be good in industry. It's the job of universities, as I said, to give you the basics and to draw you out. And one of the most powerful things you can do, and I was fortunate to do it every summer, is have internships where you go out and work in industry or work on a research project and see the practical sides of what's being taught to you. And then go back to the university and demand, as I did, that they they stream you in the direction you wanna go. That's one. And the second thing that I think is extremely important and isn't often emphasized in universities is that you need to develop communication skills. By that, I mean the ability to listen and understand what someone's saying and to then be able to take your ideas and communicate it back effectively. I think the the weakest thing I see in 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 a lot of my peers and certainly in students coming out is how often they have great ideas and can't express those ideas or communicate them to those around. Thank you. I would I would really like if I can um, build on that uh, what what Peter said and one, what Monica said. 
Um, so I'm, of course, coming from a different angle of the exploration geophysicist, more in a mining sector. But uh, building on this environmental aspects and communication aspects, what we are also seeing at EH Materials, what is a very crucial skill, the geophysicist or geoscientist being in a, in a field, it's um, knowing the, the, the problem of the social license to operate and actually um, communicating the science. So oftentimes we are in the field and um, in this field, in this field, we have um, other communities living, other animals living. And it's very important that we properly also communicate what we are doing, our science, to the wider public. Because it is oftentimes the case that people are afraid of what they are not knowing. They will um, block, they could simply block uh, any, any exploration process. And um, in Europe, at least, it takes at, um, around 15 years to open a mine. Well, which is uh, quite a long time. Right now, um, European, Europe is striving to um, secure its um, raw materials for clean uh, energy, for clean mobility. And this will not happen without the exploration and without um, with the raw materials actually coming from the Europe. So uh, this is very important also that we as a geoscientist also advocate for this um, not in my backyard attitude and we communicate our science properly and um, of course calmly but also we have the scientific knowledge so this is very important. Um, building on that I would also like to say that we at EH Raw Materials we have six different master programs and so what we are um, looking for and what we try to build on those six master programs is that uh, we want to build, um, create or shape a T-shaped professional. So with a professional after our master programs who have a deep understanding of their disciplines, but also um, wider perspective on the whole raw materials value chain. So not only uh, knowing how to do the exploration, but also knowing what are the economics, what is, uh, what is the demand for, for the materials that we're going to explore. And also know about the sustainability issues, about the about the, uh, poly how to communicate with the policymakers. So having this uh, wider um, knowledge, the knowing of work in the interdisciplinary teams is very, very important for us. And at the same time, we also um, envision that entrepreneurial skills, apart from the communication skills, are very important because we are also supporting uh, startups that are coming from the universities. So uh, we also have a lot of programs for our students, how to create the startups, how to work with the business model canvas, because oftentimes you are a very skilled uh, professional, you know your math, you know your physics, but then when it comes to monetizing your idea, this can, uh, becomes problematic. So this is also something that we are trying to teach our students how to actually uh, be entrepreneurial in, in their uh, disciplines. Uh, Anna and all, uh, following up what Peter said about internships, I wanted to know, since you are the one young professionals in this panel, what was your experience with internships? Had you had access to enough opportunities to have real practice during the course of your studies? You don't have to go in details as to what, but in general, what's your, if you had or you didn't. So should I go ahead or? <laughs> um, Okay, so, so yes, I graduated last year and I graduated from one of the EAT Raw Materials Master Programs. And um, during master programs, the internship at the industry or a research organization is actually obligatory. We get, uh, in the European system, we get the credits for it. So it's an obligation to the industry uh, internship. And uh, it worked like that, that uh, EAT Raw Materials is a network of the partners across Europe. So uh, we had the access to, um, to actually the different industries that uh, we would like to do the, our in, internships. And I was lucky enough because I was studying at Uppsala University, which was really well connected with the uh, exploration and mining companies there in Sweden. And I did my uh, internship in one of the biggest underground iron ore mines uh, in Kiruna and LKB. So that was actually quite easy because uh, yeah, I, I got this connection straight from my professors and uh, that's what we are also trying to aim at EAT Raw Materials Master programs. How about you Vinicius? Yeah I had I had the same uh, opportunity I was I was an intern for Halliburton in the, the last year of um, college so that was uh, 2017 and I, I totally agree with what Peter Duncan uh, said about uh, 
universities don't have the really uh, obligation of, of uh, teaching everything. I think you have to go for it and try uh, new things, uh, for example, in the industry. And for me, it was really good. It was really good because uh, I, I started looking at seismic interpretation and uh, geological modeling in Halliburton. And that's basically what I'm doing right now in, in Echo Patrol. So for me, it was, it was a, a great experience. Uh, and just to add on the geophysicists of the future, uh, I think all the soft skills must be uh, uh, the same, right? So you have to be curious, you have to, to have a good group relation, you have to have good communication skills. Uh, but also what I think uh, it's important is that geophysicists, as curious people, they need to have to try to approach a problem in different ways so they can, they can have different results. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my opinion. And also, also remember, just want to add, uh, I think the leading edge uh, last year, I think David Lumley uh, wrote an article about the future of, the, of, of geophysics. And it's important to remember that we always talk about oil and gas, but we can also go to water management, uh, mining, renewables, even uh, now uh, spatial exploration, who knows? So I think uh, there's still a lot of, a lot of um, things to do. So after you complete your education, you're willing to put into practice all the knowledge you acquired, right? And the course of your career won't necessarily be a straight line. And depending on what you decide uh, it should be, then it will be affected more or less by a worldwide political, economical events, crisis, etc. So let's hear what the, our panel has to say about career-related advice. Uh, this is a specific question for Clark, Peter, and Manika. How do you compare the current state of the exploration industry with what you've seen during the course of your career? I'll take a stab. <laughs> I'll take a stab at that. Uh, this is the, probably the worst downturn there's ever been in, in the oil gas industry because it's combined with uh, COVID-19, uh, which killed demand and simultaneously uh, it shut down other industries. So, uh, uh, they're not working very well. Um, and uh, on top of that, we had this happen to correspond to a time when the Saudis and Russians couldn't agree on limiting production, so the price was already on a downward trend. So uh, this is a pretty bad time. One, one of the questions I answered, uh, typed in, was, you know, what, uh, what would you advise someone to do if they're in school right now? Go on for a PhD or try to get an industry job. I would say right now, don't don't go for an industry job. They aren't out there, and they're, no one's hiring. They're laying people off. So, uh, but that doesn't mean there's not a future to it. And and also, I, I really like uh, Vincius. Vincius brought up something I think is very important. Oil and gas exploration won't last forever. Um, you there are other alternatives, and and you just have to expect to be able to take your skills and use them for some some other something else like mining, uh, mapping out faults for hazards and things like that can be done with seismic data. Uh, and you can also use passive seismic to, to identify active faults, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of work for geophysicists besides uh, hunting for the evil oil and gas. So I'll jump in here if I may. Um, yes, I agree with uh, Clark. This is the worst I've ever seen our industry. But it is a cyclical industry and I've been around and around several times. I started my career in the mining end of things, working for Shell, who, Shell Canada, who had a mining division at the time. We were going gung-ho and then all of a sudden one day got the call that we all had to head to the head office and be fired. Because Shell had decided sort of, hey, we're not gonna do mining anymore and you're unemployed. Kind of one of the darkest days in my life for that moment. But the next day, there was another day. Uh, I ended up moving over into oil and gas. And if you can imagine, I moved to the United States from Canada in 1986. And when I got down here, everybody said, why in the world would you move in 1986 or at, at this time to oil and gas exploration when we are in the ditch and everybody's being laid off? Shucks, compared to the mining business, I thought it was pretty gung-ho. And the fact of the matter is we've carried on since then. The, me the, the one lesson I have learned, well, a lesson that I've learned, I've probably learned many and I hope to learn one every day, but a lesson that I've learned is that your only security is you. 
Your only security is your own talent, your own initiative, your own industry, your own uh, ability to work hard. And that life is going to throw a whole bunch of crap at you at different times. And as one book I've got on my shelf said, uh, life is 5% what it throws at you and 95% what you do with it. Geophysicists are incredibly, by their very nature, incredibly talented or gifted to be able to handle these tough situations and to move into different ways of using what they know and what they know how to. And so I, I would encourage anybody, it's a great education and there will be a career. I think the oil and gas business is gonna be around for another 20 or 40 years anyway, in different forms, but there are lots of opportunities outside of oil and gas. Mining is a great career, smaller. Geothermal's on the way. Yes, there will be careers as geophysicists. And although it's bad now, it'll get better. Monica? So I think uh, um, we have all faced challenges and it's what you make out of it. As uh, I think Linda was saying that uh, there will be points in your career where you think you can't go forward. We can be like crabs and go sideways. And that's really what we are always going to do. You can chalk out your career and I guarantee you Whatever you think you're going to do today, you will be doing something very different 10 years from now. It's our ability to be able to reinvent ourselves that propel us, that make us successful in what we do. Um, I, and I, I go with a group of uh, women for skiing once a year. We do everything else but ski. And so we went out, I think, uh, for, three, four years ago, and we had the mini downturn. And one of the uh, uh, women who's been in the field for a long time, just started saying, okay, you know what? This is not the first time we've seen this downturn. Here's what I did the last three, four, five times I was in a downturn. I had to feed my family, so I took up a job in a department store. That's what she did. But she said she stayed true to her profession in the evening. It might be difficult on the weekends. It might be difficult for sure. You have a family, you have a day job to do, but she volunteered her time. She went out and talked to people and said, tell me what's going on now. Tell me lectures I can attend. Tell me uh, places I can volunteer where my knowledge that I've been trained for will be useful. And that opened new the directions for her. And that's something that we usually forget. We think we have to leave geophysics and do something else. No, we can do a, a day job while still maintaining skills in what we are trained to do best. And that's what will keep us going. That's what will give us new directions. I think that's, that was the best example. And when I look back to my career, I think that's what we've been doing. You will have distractions, you will have daily problems of feeding yourself, finding a home, having enough money to do all that. But you will also have people who will draw you in into the technical sphere. And the single best thing you can do is stay technical. Keep that branch open. Thank you, Thank you Monica. Uh, before we move to the next question, I just wanted to tell our panelists, uh, that the audience have not had access to those questions that you're referring to. So just maybe answer the question that the moderator is currently asking. And then uh, because the audience don't have the list of questions and they don't know the other topics that we, we plan to discuss. So Aurelien? You have already mentioned that there is growing demand, that there is more than just oil and gas and the exploration geophysics industry. And arguably, there will be growing demand for geophysicists working in the alternative greener energy sector or the exploration for raw materials. Um, how do you think will this affect uh, people and companies in the oil and gas industry? How will this affect your companies? How will this affect yourself? Maybe we can start with Vinicius. So, okay. 
Um, so my opinion is that I, I personally expect and hope that the demand for greener energy source increases. And I think although, I don't know, maybe for 10, 15, 20 years, the oil and gas will be the main one, uh, I think we have to move each day to a more uh, diverse uh, world in terms of uh, energy source. However, I don't, I don't think uh, the oil and gas industry will be uh, so uh, affected by this, this change. And, and I say that because uh, there are a lot of geophysicists uh, graduating each year and each one of them have different desires in which industry they want to go. And, and also when we come to a crisis like this one, there are so many people being, being laid off. And I think even if we change as we are doing right now slowly to a greener uh, energy source, I think uh, the gap for the oil and gas industry will, be, will, be, will, be, will not happen because you're gonna have a lot of geophysicists still going to the oil and gas uh, industry. Peter, how is this for you as a CEO, president of a company? So the, uh, our oil and gas practice, which is frack monitoring, has pretty much hit the ditch. 90% um, of fracking was done in the United States and there's virtually none going on right now or very little. And what is going on is the, the Clients, the oil companies are so worried about their bottom line, understandably, that they can't afford the science that we provide. So they're just going and fracking blindly, which I think is a real shame. They're wasting resources, but that's, that's the economics of it. But as Confucius said, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And what's happened to us is that with the, with the practice that we have of doing passive seismic, of listening for events, other opportunities for microseismic monitoring have, have just appeared almost magically, maybe because we were open, our eyes were open by not having work in other areas. So I actually have a rather large project right now um, in, in Florida that's related to detecting karst development in, phosphate, in a phosphate mining um, environment that is uh, presenting some really neat technical problems and we're installing our first prototype business and I see that as a business that can develop to be almost as big as my frack monitoring business worldwide and I wasn't even really looking for it until our business uh, fell back. Similarly I see the geothermal business coming up. Uh, the biggest nuclear reactor we have anywhere near us is sitting in the center of the earth and people are starting to think about harvesting the heat from it and it is a uh, a process where building the heat exchangers requires fracking and hence frack monitoring. So while my oil and gas business is in the ditch and while my financials look terrible right now, I do see that there, um, that there are other things that we can do and we're moving into doing them while we wait for the oil and gas business to come back. Anybody else? Anna, you have already made this transition from standard exploration geophysics to the exploration of raw materials. What's your position on this? Uh, yes, not entirely because I ended up in the education sector at the end. <laughs> uh, but yes, well, at the EH raw materials, we are focused on, on extraction of the raw materials. And so we see with uh, what's happening at the European Union level with the European Green New Deal, and uh, securing the raw materials for, for, for Europe and securing this raw materials for the green uh, technologies, green energy, um, future mobility. There are no electric cars without uh, lithium mining. Or Then uh, we see that the exploration and the geoscience, uh, it's very much demand when it comes to Europe. I think, um, if I may, Aurelien, the uh, exploration geophysicists are still very much in demand because even if we're not exploring for oil and gas, we still need to monitor our sequestration projects. We still have enough subsurface activity where we need geophysicists. We need geophysicists to map geothermal uh, uh, energy uh, fractures in uh, our geothermal energy plants. So there are a lot of opportunities for 
um, geophysicists to do remote sensing. We, can, we need uh, people to be giving us early warning for earthquakes, impending disasters. So there is a big uh, field out there which has been shadowed, badly shadowed by oil and gas just because of the money that oil and gas brought into the field. And now I think that the, this is more of a leveled playing field where other energy sectors, other uh, uh, sequestration, contamination, mapping uh, require geophysics. And we need to just be, be open to these opportunities. I think that's where we will find a big focus, a big thrust. And the other part, which is really a, a, a big uh, a thing that is happening is the humanitarian aspect of geophysics. That has been slowly developing and I think that will start becoming more and more important, which is how do you make small uh, um, homemade exploration devices? How do you build them? We can build resistivity surveys, right? And so there, there is a big need for it. We can train people to do that. We can have how-to procedures on online, free for anyone. That's where the new focus is going to be. That's where it has to be. We cannot afford to not have that. Uh, you've all, uh, a constant in, in your participations has been adapting. Adapting to what's coming, go to other application of geophysics for other, all, I mean, the same method, but in other applications, uh, geothermal, etc. So in this kind of period, we've seen people embarking in growing trends. For example, just as an example, data science, deep learning, where they seem to have jobs. Uh, with large group of people going towards the same thing, how do we remain unique and how do we stand out? What is your opinion on this? You, you don't have to agree, but just, what do you think about this? Are these adapt or die kind of periods? Well, Peter brought up earlier the Communication, you know, that the, you need communication no matter what you do, right? And if you can't take what's in your head and put it on paper or put it into a presentation, then you're never going to go anywhere. That's how you stand out as you, you become a good communicator. And then you can go to, into any industry. It doesn't have to be geophysics. So are Certainly. the soft skills the ones that made us stand out? The soft skills only? That, that was my experience. I, I mean, I was pretty good at mathematics, uh, not the best, but one of the best. Uh, but that wasn't what made me stand out. It was the fact that I could take these complicated ideas and present them in a way that even management could understand it. Any other take on this? I think you will still need geophysical knowledge. We can train machines to do predictions, but a machine will not know the difference of uh, or will not put the physics behind the problem. That's where we come in and that will always be needed. I think we can train the machine, but uh, data QC, what data do you input? All of those problems, the domain knowledge will have to come from a geophysicist. If we hand over everything and we trust machines blindly, we might end up mislabeling the problem. We might uh, end up misidentifying solutions. So I don't think uh, that part is gone. I think our jobs are becoming better by using machine learning, by using uh, uh, deep learning, artificial intelligence. It's not that we are being replaced. We are just being better in what we do. It's pretty much, think of it when computers came in, the geophysicist, uh, uh, seismic interpreters did not lose their jobs. We became better at doing seismic interpretation. And that's pretty much the same thing today. We have better tools. We'd be good to adopt them rather than fight against them. So to answer your question, my, my take on your question, Joe Marie, um, is it adapt or die? Yes. Um, how do you stand out in these new industries or in these new disciplines as you move out? Uh, I go back to, and agree with Clark, communicate, to be able to communicate what you're doing to your bosses, to your community, to your constituency. That's, uh, that's important, uh, perhaps number one. Number two, or maybe it's number one, is that you have to be a doer. 
you have to be the one who, when, when whoever is, whether it's your advisor or your supervisor or your manager, when that person says, I've got this problem and I need to solve it, you need to be the one who jumps front and says, I'm going to tackle that. Let me take that on and then let me get back to you. The people who sit in their office and noodle, afraid to raise their hand, afraid to stick their head up above the fence, they get lost. If you, if you take the industry and put yourself out front and do, you don't even have to do the best work of those around you. You don't have to be right all the time, make mistakes, but damn it, get out there and do things and then communicate what you've done. Yeah, I, I agree with that, that, that being a problem solver is, is another way to, to stand out because there's a lot of, I used to joke about being the dark side of science. There's a lot of scientists who say, oh, we tried that 10 years ago. That's, that's not a solvable problem. Well, that, that's not helpful, guys. At least let me try to solve it. And that's what I did. I tried to solve it. You, you don't always succeed, obviously, but sometimes you do. I think a failed attempt is still an attempt. We learn from failures, so we always report success stories. But I think we need to report more. Hey, we tried that, this, is, this failed. We think it's because of this and this, so that others don't keep making the same mistakes. And I think, Clark, Clark you said that very well. This, we tried that, we need to communicate. Okay. I'm just going to add one point to that. Um, I think, of course, we, we have to, to, to look at the, the main trend. So today we, we see everyone talking about AI, uh, machine learning, deep learning. Um, but I think in, in the end, the one which is going to run the, the, the drive the, 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 the problem is a human. So I think we still need professionals with a solid background in geology and geophysics. Otherwise, we're just going to have an input to the machine, which is wrong which doesn't respect some, some uh, theoretical uh, loss. So I think, yes, that there's a trend. And, and I think in the end, it's about combining both the, the geologists and the geophysicists and also the, the data science people. It's not about replacing the geophysicists or geologists, it's about combining them. I would just like to add to uh, how to stand out and be unique. I think, uh, one point which I missed here in this conversation was uh, yeah, very uh, hard skills, soft skills. But I think what I would say how to stand out and what also being for six years almost in SEG taught me and EAG and other, other communities is join the community, uh, join the events, network and meet people. Because at the end, if you're going to um, be recruited and you have a person um, that knows you and know the, how, how, what kind of person you are you, I think you're going to be more highly recruited uh, and trusted than the person that is a bit less known and maybe have the same qualification as you. So I think the networking part, net recommendation, someone can recommend you to some job, uh, I think this is a very, very important um, part. And I know that going to the conferences and to the different events, it's a bit harder right now because we cannot meet physically. But the opportunities like this, uh, webinars like this, uh, there's still opportunity to connect with people and grow your network. So I would really come from this. Uh, this is the way what I would say how to stand out. Quite a few of my connections have approached me with the idea that these times of crisis are actually opportunities to go back to school, or either stay in school with a request for a short answer. Would you agree that this is a good advice? And if you agree, what is your best advice or recommendation to successfully change between academia or research and industry and vice versa? Never a good advice to use university as a parking spot. Sorry. If you are developing skills, yes. If you are expanding your technical knowledge, yes, broaden your horizon, use the time. You don't get a job, go back to school, but go back with a purpose. If you're going there just to sit and bide your time and fill out your curriculum vitae, that's a very bad idea because your grades will show you will be miserable because you will not like what you're doing and you will resent your faculty for making you do certain things and so be gentle on us and don't park. <laughs> I, 
I, I have to agree with Monica. I recently have had several students come to me and say, should I go back and get a PhD? Will that, and sometimes it's, I'll get a PhD and that'll guarantee me a job or to park. I always tell them that you should only go back for a PhD if you really have a deep need to go deeper into the science than you've already gone in a formal way. I don't think you should ever stop learning. And in fact, every change of my career has exposed me to more data, another data set. And it's like every five years of my career has been like doing another PhD. To go back and do it at school, you're not getting paid as much. You should do it because you want to interact with those professors and be in that academic environment. You shouldn't do it because you think it's a way to get a job. And, and I feel absolutely terrible if it's just putting in time. Um, so I don't know, I have to agree with everything that Monica said and, and take pity on her. Don't go there and just occupy space, leave it for someone else. Thank you for your input, Peter. So uh, rapid, uh, passing from career to another topic, we are social beings, right? We like to belong and connect and meet with people with similar interests. That includes professional interests and, and professional organizations such as SED, and I'm sure you belong to others. Uh, that has also been impacted by COVID-19, the way we socialize, either personally or professionally. As, and, as Anna was saying, there are increasing webinars and, and online events, etc. So do we still need to gather for big international conferences? What would be the pros and cons? Uh, how do you balance that? What, what would be your take for the future on that? Any volunteers? I'll, I'll say a couple of words. <laughs> um, there, there are things you can't get from these sorts of gatherings. People's minds wander. Um, you, but when you're face to face with someone having a discussion, their mind doesn't wander as much. <laughs> there, you, there are things that you're going to get out of that face to face conversation. You're never going to get out of seeing a little tiny two inch picture on your on your video screen. Um, I would when I was working and. Uh, management would want us to do video conferencing instead of having face-to-face -face meetings with a contractor because they might be over in London or someplace where it was an expensive uh, trip. Um, I pointed out the times that we solve problems when we were in the room with the people, looking at the data, seeing their reactions, and reading the body language. That, that all these human things are important in every field, and geophysics is no different. So, I'm a... Um most anybody who knows what I've done knows that I'm kind of an SEG hack and I've been I've been to every SEG since 1986 and I've been to probably 15 or 20 EAGEs uh, conferences the annual conference and certainly this difficult time and and all of us learning to use environments like the one we're on in right now it has been an extreme eye-opener for me and opened up on the opportunities that this presents. However, I go to the SEG and the EAGE as much to see old friends and to participate, to feel part of a, of a community in a way that I don't think you can in an online environment. And I sure hope that all of this Zooming and the way we can do it so much more cheaply doesn't kill that opportunity to travel, to be with a group of people from different countries and experience their cultures, to open our eyes to the different ways that people think, and just, just to hang around and have fun with a bunch of geo-nerds. I think that is very true. I enjoy meetings because I, over the years, uh, we've built friendships. And those friendships are very valuable. At the same time, I find that we have participation from people who cannot normally come to meetings, either financially, visa reasons, for whatever reasons that might be, or, or they can't get away from what they're doing. This allows us to increase that dimension. And that's a very, very valuable thing. I think we are, by having Zoom meetings, we are providing access to a larger segment of geophysicists who might normally never come to meetings like this. 
So while I crave personal attention, I think uh, Zoom meetings like this, you cannot talk, cross talk. When the best thing to happen is when I'm talking, Peter gets an idea or Linda gets an idea or Anna gets an idea and they come in and, and I become silent because I realize what they're saying is really, really building on what I was trying to build and I was not expressing myself as clear. So that part is missing. The communications are not as efficient and so on. But the reach is way more than any personal meeting. Uh, and and I really, if I were to weigh one against the other, I would say I prefer to have a wider reach than to have my personal interconnection. It just is more valuable, I think. Um, I, I totally agree with, uh, with what everyone said. But one thing that I, that I really wish is that even after all this COVID situation ends and we can go back to normal, uh, the virtual activities and, and all the webinars keep going because it, it's really good, at least for me, I'm seeing uh, a bunch of uh, different types of webinars from geomechanics, uh, seismic interpretation, seismic processes, and, and it's, I, can, I can see whenever I want. So I think that that, that thing should uh, keep going, even when we go back to normal. Yes, I would also like to, oh, sorry, Linda, go ahead. No, go ahead, Anna, <laughs> jump in after you. Uh, so, so coming from the perspective of a person who is now organizing such virtual events and virtualizing all of the activities for the students, uh, I would say definitely the contact, the interaction, this is something that we will not achieve in the virtual environment. Um, but I see there are also a lot of opportunities um, of, 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 as you were saying, being more accessible to the wider audience. Um, so this is an opportunity, but also a bit of a threat. Uh, well, you can see it in uh, two ways, because, for example, if someone is going to the conference, they are really committed. They are staying for there because they paid. And then when you're doing something online, you can drop in, drop out at any time, which is also sometimes good for, for, the, for the participant because why would he waste a time if he's not interested in the talk, right? So um, it can be also seen as opportunity, as a threat, definitely as a money saver. Um, I think those um, virtualizing um, events might be um, also saving money, uh, not mentioning uh, saving some emissions for, for flying back and forth from a different parts of the world. Uh, but definitely the, the contact, uh, the interaction is uh, something that we will all miss, uh, yes, coming from conferences to conferences, meeting and building the group and building your personal network, not only of professionals, but also of friends at the end. The only other thing that I would want to add to that is I, I think what at least currently is missing uh, from the virtual versus the um, in-person opportunities. I think the in-person opportunities probably offers more of an opportunity for the more serendipitous finds, walking through the exhibit hall, or just stopping to have a conversation with somebody where you make a connection that turns on that light bulb and you realize, oh, this is exactly what I needed, but you didn't know to look for it. Um, so I, I think that's one of the important things. But at the same time, uh, I think that the uh, the missing op, uh, missing of interaction, the ability to build friendships, is really just another problem for us to solve. It's not a fixed issue, um, and and my hope is that in the coming months, uh, that we'll look at digital opportunities that help create ways in which people can have those chance meetings with each other, uh, maybe smaller group meetings online where you have the opportunity to build those lifelong friendships and still be able to gain the benefits that uh, Monika mentioned of accessibility. Uh, from my standpoint as a global society for SEG, that accessibility issue is huge. Uh, in order for us to be able to reach um, our global membership with the levels of training that we offer uh, at meetings that, you know, particularly annual meeting uh, that happens in the U.S. Um, and with a lot of our uh, continuing education opportunities to be able to expand across the globe and not have a tremendous amount of expense that comes with travel. 
I think is a, a wonderful opportunity. And I look forward to seeing how the science changes because people in other parts of the world have access to the great training uh, and, and educational opportunities. I would like to pick up on what uh, Linda just said, because um, even more than geophysics, the one thing that connects us all is this society, this community uh, that we call SEG. Um, how do you think that uh, the programs and offers that SEG has and the society in general, or all nonprofit societies, will change in the years and decades to come, or maybe even have to change in order to stay relevant? I think geosciences suffers the most, perhaps, of lack of diversity in geoscience. I think as SEG, um, we see a, a way to use this plot platform to promote diversity in geoscience, to have equitable sharing in knowledge and equitable sharing in jobs across the society, across the globe. And that, I think, is what, uh, what we would strive to do. That's the place for every geophysical or nonprofit society. Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, but perhaps uh, uh, I have a more blinded view of things, but uh, I really see uh, that as being one of the biggest issues that challenge us today. No disagreement from me. What about the others? Vinicius, how do you see your role within SEG? Is it still relevant for you as an emerging professional since we always unfortunately see this, this drop of membership numbers when students graduate and then they have to stay within society as an emerging professional? How is the situation for you? Okay, so uh, personally SEG uh, plays a really important role uh, where I am today. Uh, and I say that because um, since I started in, in college uh, interacting with SEG in 2015, uh, I, I have participated in so, so many programs. Uh, so I've, I've, I've participated in the SLS program, the Student Leadership Symposium. I have done the SEP, the Student Education Program. I have participated in the Challenge Ball Finals with Peter Duncan in 2017 in Houston. Uh, <laughs> I have also participated in Anaheim, California, uh, the Evolve program. So basically, uh, it's really, I mean, uh, I think what outstands when you go to an interview or something like that, is that you don't have only the, the good grades in your CV, you have something else to show. And um, yeah, for me, SCG plays, plays a really important role, and at least for when I participated in all those programs, I met people from all over the world. So uh, people from, I think, more than, than 30 countries, maybe. So for me, it was, it was really good. So really, and I think I, I, this is a tough question. And I'm incoming president for the GSH in Houston, and we're facing this. We're talking about this problem all the time. But the way you phrase the question sort of makes me want to answer because you say, is the SEG or our organizations like this still relevant or will they be relevant in the future? That sort of makes it sound like the SEG is something over here that people can join. And really what it is, I see it more of a, as a professional society, a community of people who, who decide to join and then make it into what they want it to be. And yes, it will change. I'm sure since 1930, the, the culture, the attitude, the ideas of it have changed a lot. And I'll relate to you what's going on at the GSH right now in Houston. Uh, we're run, as a lot of these organizations are, by a lot of um, old guys with white hair like me. The board of directors is a bunch of old guys. And surely because it's worked for us in the past, we tend to do things the same all the time. But a group of our members, who are really interested in the GSH. They're dedicated earth scientists. They love geophysics and they want to be part of a community. They sort of formed this subcommittee. They did it on their own, calling themselves the next gen 
geophysical group. And they have started coming to our board meetings and saying, well, we want to do this and we want to do that and we want to do this. And you know, the initial, I see it, I look around the table and I see that the initial reaction when these young folks come in and say they want to do something different, but to the old folks like me is, whoa, you can't do that. And we have to shut that down. We have to listen to the next group that are coming along and saying, good, go do it and encourage them. And then the SEG will become what it needs to be to be the organization that those people want and make and carry into the future. Looking at the time, this already brings us to our closure because we still want to answer some of the questions coming from the audience. So I would like to ask all of our panelists to provide one final advice that you can give to um, students and emerging professionals in the audience to sh successfully shape their own future in exploration geophysics. What's the one thing that you would like to tell people to have the successful career? I think I'm going to wait for the experts to, to say because I, I want to listen to. <laughs> Well, okay, I'll start. Uh, and Jack Welch, guy who ran GM or whatever, GE, I guess, for a long time, he said, if you don't, if you aren't enjoying what you're doing, you won't do good work. So I know it's, it may be, it may be what ignorant of me or, or just stupid to say that it's easy to go do something that you need. As, as Manika said earlier, you may have to do something for a while to feed your family or whatever. But at the end of the day, if you, the, the most important thing, you're spending a third of your life doing it, enjoy what you're doing. And if you do enjoy it, you'll do better work, you'll get better rewards for it. And, oh, I don't know, the bluebirds will sing, but heavens, do something enjoyable. Tweet, tweet. So, <laughs> but I think one thing which I would say is also bring humility. If someone asks you about your job, be able to explain in simple words what you do. Don't hide behind jargon. Because that person who's asking you might, in our view, when I'm looking at someone who says, well, what do you do? I think, wow, someone took the gave me an opportunity to explain what I do, and I go off and explain in all sorts of jargon, and that person walks away. So the humility that we bring to explain what we do, such that it has a relevance for the person who's asking. They ask us for a reason. So try to understand why people are asking us to explain what we do. I think that's one big thing. And you'll find people whom you relate most to, the educators that you really relate to, or the people who are leaders, they can communicate a very complex idea in simple terms. And that's the thing that we need to bring to the table. I guess my answer would be similar to Peter's is, is try to enjoy what you're doing. And if you just can't do that, get out of it. You know, talk, uh, look, look for something else to do that you do enjoy where your, your skills are useful and you can make a contribution. Okay. Um, basically, one thing that we, we heard from you guys now is that do something that you have passion for. So. Coming back to that question about the, the main trend of machine learning, deep learning, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because this is the most important trend right now that you have to go that way. You have to, to, to go the way that you, you like the most. But okay, just to, to, to wrap up my part here, uh, there's one book, uh, which is 52 Things You Should Know About Geophysics by Matt Hall. And in one of the chapters, he talked about the five things I, I wish I would know. And I'm going to mention three here, uh, which I thought it was really cool, which is network in and out of work. Uh, learn to code, not necessarily to become a machine learning expert or a software developer, but just to, to learning a bit of, of coding helps you a lot in the daily basis. And I have experienced that. 
uh, and also always go always go the extra inch so if your boss asks you for something try to try to go a little bit further and besides that what i can say from my experience i i i told you guys that i think scg played a really important role uh, where i am today i think as the job market gets uh, more and more competitive good grades are not uh, what what uh, is going to make you outstand so uh, engaging student chapters, uh, participate in competitions, apply for different programs, um, and I think in the end this is going to make you outstand. I can I can give you one example here in Brazil. Um, I don't know, uh, maybe six years ago, if you if you speak English, you pretty much get a job because that's a, a big difference uh, in, in here. Nowadays, there are job interviews that is not even asking only for English, but also Spanish. So jo job markets are getting so much uh, competitive that you have to, 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 to look for new things to, to put in your CV and things that make you, make you happy. So uh, that's, this would be my, my advice. Okay, so I guess this is my turn now. Uh, well, I would say as a recent graduate, graduating last year, I would say be patient. I think patience is a very important skill that this is something that we learn all the time and uh, you're, you're fresh out of your studies and you're ambitious students, you, you thought that you made all of this, um, I don't know, great grades, uh, you took part in those activities and you'll get a job like that. But this is a, yeah, this is a real life word and the industry needs are really varying. So it's, uh, it's not your fault when, when you're happening to graduate uh, with the timing. So be patient, the time will come, there, there is always opportunity for you. And I think um, look into what you really like. I think this, that's also what Peter and Monica said, what you really like doing and uh, what are really your strengths. So um, I also graduated as a geophysicist, uh, but I really, what I found out after just six years of working, uh, well, not working, volunteering for SEG uh, in the student chapters, is that I really like to giving back to the community, organizing the events and, and doing something for, for the other fellow students while still being in a, in a geophysics or, or geoscience sector. So I think, um, look deep inside you, uh, what you've been doing throughout your studies. Um, maybe this is some, you would discover something different. So apart from being patient, maybe be also a bit more flexible and don't get uh, frustrated if the, the, the opportunity that you were looking for is not coming straight away. So that, that would be my advice. Um, the thought that I have is um, it's, it's quite similar to what everyone else is saying. I think this is all great advice, but I think what's really important is for you to be clear on what's important to you, on what you value uh, most, what your priorities are, and allow those things to be the things that guide your decisions. Um, it's easy when you're really anxious and uh, uh, afraid of the future to let fear make decisions for you, but um, your future is much uh, more hopeful. Your um, experience is much more enjoyable if it's your values that are making the decisions for you. And so really pay attention to those things. Pay attention to your fear. Pay attention. Be clear on what you, you value in life and make your decisions according to that. And I think uh, you're going to weather any of these bumpy times, if, if you know those things about yourself. Thank you so much for your input. Uh, we are short of time, so we'll move to some uh, questions that the audience have asked. And let's try, I'll try to summarize them uh, so we don't spend too much time. Um, the first question is specifically for Peter uh, from Germano Hea. In your view, what will an exploration seismograph have to have in 20 years from now? Wow. Uh, that's a big question. I think it'll have to have lots and lots and lots of channels, really dense sampling, and be able to reduce the data in real time. So it'll have to be kind of like an MRI that you can read off the screen instantly. Thank you. The second question, if someone could summarize the applications, geophysical applications that are not oil and gas related, but with some detail, 
that question asks for that. So not, mm -hmm. right, not oil and gas related, I think you can have um, archaeology. So geophysics as an archaeological tool where you go out and it's really exciting. You can either do exploration or you can look for ancient earthquakes, looking at uh, descriptions of earthquakes. And that's a fascinating field. If you are slightly interested in history and in archaeology and in ancient scripts, that is a very, very interesting place to get lost in. Uh, you can look at uh, uh, CO2 sequestration. We still have a problem of knowing where, when we put CO2 in the subsurface, where does it go? How much do we still have? The mass balance in CO2 sequestration projects is still a big issue. That has a huge potential for geophysics. Mining geophysics, that is uh, uh, rare earth, rare elements geophysics, that is. Uh, required um, in, in contamination transport, residence time and transport of contamination. There are plenty of things. As we increase populations in coastal areas, we are pulling up uh, uh, sweet water. So the table, the demarcation between salt water and sea, uh, fresh water is either becoming more uh, uh, fuzzy. So you drop brackish water or it's becoming shallower. And so there are, there are a host of things beyond or apart from oil and gas where geophysics plays a huge role. And I'm sure uh, uh, the Anna and Vinci's uh, and Peter and Clark and Linda, especially with the global geophysics efforts, the GWB in, uh, in, 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 in he can add a host of applications that are out there. Thank you. Um, another question is about how the integration of different types of geophysical data can help someone grow as a researcher. Mention as an example, seismic potential fields, et cetera. How that experience of integrating data can help you grow. Who wants to take this one? Well, okay. John, I, I'm going to try, but um, for me, um, once one time I, I, I told someone, look, I'm not a, 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 an expert. And he said, no, I'm not an expert either. And he had like 25 years of oil and gas industry. And he said, I'm not an, an expert either. I'm just a guy who integrates everything. Uh, so basically, I think the secret is, is that it's integration. If you have um, uh, different types of, of of measuring different uh, so, uh, uh, machines to, to measure things, I think you have to see what, what is the response of each one of them and try to integrate. I think you're going to grow if you do that. If, if I may add something to that question, if you're able to jump between different group of people with understanding and big knowledge in one specific data type, and you can go through them and understand what they're saying, to arm, to put something together and know how the specific, I don't know, mineralization or oil uh, accumulation, uh, the different earth properties behave that might not be your area of expertise, so the fact that you're able to understand those and, and make a story together as a team with other groups of people, that will be helpful and will help someone grow as a researcher. Okay, um, next one. If everyone wants to hire experienced candidates in the geophysics field, how can a recent graduate land a job with only internships and minimal experience? I think that's not really true. Um, the at least I was involved in uh, recruiting people quite a bit for ExxonMobil, and uh, we were looking for experienced hires. Yes, but the main thing we were looking for was young people fresh out of school um, to to train and have a have a future, have have some sort of endurance. You know, not someone mid career, but who's going to spend twenty or thirty years. Uh, so I, I just don't, I think it's a false uh, paradigm. I have to agree. I think um, the problem with people with experience is that maybe not all that experience has been good and they've developed a lot of bad habits. I've uh, really found it more uh, to have one or two experienced people and then a lot of young kids uh, 
that we can train and, and feed on their energy and enthusiasm and curiosity. So you new graduates, sure, tough, life's tough right now. Be patient. The opportunities will come. Um, and I would say approach it like you approach grad school. You applied and when you applied to the university, you had something that set you apart, what got you selected into graduate school. Build on that. That is what will set you apart. I think I forget which one of the panelists said, if there is a crowd of people, you need to be distinguished. It's pretty much like log interpretation. You notice the anomalies more than you notice the crowd. And so if you're in a crowd, be different. You can be really, really bad and you'll be noticed, or you can be really, really good and you'll be noticed. Either way, you'll be noticed. So, so that's the thing which would be setting you apart. What I would like to add to here, uh, of course, uh, getting internship is always challenging. Um, but what I found when I was studying on my bachelor in geophysics, there are always opportunities out to go out to the field. Either this is a SUG field camp happening somewhere in the world or maybe even near you. Um, there is some project running on, um, on uh, your campus and they need people to carry, out, carry the cables. Uh, I know this doesn't sound glorious, but go out to the field and get this experience because if you go out to the field, even carry cables, you still learn. You still learn how to lay those cables, how to work with the equipment. And at the end, you also learn how the equipment works and looks like, because sometimes you, you have all this theory uh, about, for example, electrodes, but you never saw an electrode in your life. So I think this is very important to go out to the field, use every single opportunity to go out, because this is something I think that will also differentiate you. And for example, uh, if you're in the field, you know, one, theory is one thing, but sometimes uh, in the field, or it's not maybe sometimes, but oftentimes something broke. And I think having this case, okay, I was in the field, something broke, we find a solution how to fix it, uh, might be also something that will depreciate you uh, on your interview, on your CV, or will show you that you have a real um, case <laughs> experience and then just a theory uh, and your good marks. That is so true. Uh, anytime I've done any interview, people who've been out in the field always are a notch higher for me. But I would also say one of the great things about going in the field as a geophysicist is you learn some of the squishy things about data that later you have to interpret. And maybe that teaches you not to put such a fine pencil on the interpretation when you start to understand the errors that went into gathering the data. I think one, one more thing that's really important to keep in mind when you're looking for a job, whether you're experienced or not, uh, when you apply for it and when you interview for it, do your homework. Know as much about that company as you possibly can. If you can find out information about the people who will interview you, uh, do that. Do your research and do some homework ahead of time to make uh, an application of your skills, your interests to the things that that company is interested in, what they value, what uh, they're focused on. I think that's a really important way to stand out. I'd like to add something to what you just said, Linda, is, is when you do an interview, it's, it's a two-way interview. They're interviewing you, but you should interview the company because when, when the industry comes back, it's going to come back in a big way. These companies have laid off people. They're going to go find other fields to work in. There's going to be a huge shortage of exploration geophysicists in the near future. And you should be choosing between the companies, which one's right for you. Um, so ask them questions and you'll stand out. Instead of just sitting there passively answering, that's one of the ways you can stand out. Thank you. Oh, really? Do we want to answer one more question? So there's a philosophical question. How to be a good geophysicist? This is coming from an anonymous attendee. So how much time do we have? <laughs> Not much. We passed, we're past the hour, but... Yeah, we're running out of time, but um, would anybody like to, to comment on this? How to be a good geophysicist? Maybe some of the more experienced people on the panel? 
I'll just say there's not one model for a good geophysicist. I, I was the more theoretically inclined. I, I like the experiment to work and it ver be verified, but I also like to be able to explain it mathematically at the end. I worked with people that I much admired who were entirely intuitive. They processed data, they knew how to get things done, but they couldn't tell you, they couldn't write down a single equation associated with what they were doing. So there, there are different career paths to follow and that, that's why you can't answer the question very easily. I would say if you question yourself, question all your assumptions and question your approach. I mean, that's the part which always keeps us honest because we can be tied down by some dogmatic, uh, like uh, uh, Clark said, we have a certain uh, uh, intuition that tells us this is how things should be and we pursue that intuition and we find confirmation for that intuition. If we don't question it, we might be wrong in our intuition. So question always what you're doing uh, gets you in the right path. Uh, with that, we would like to thank first our panelists for, for your time and for getting to know more of you not only at a professional level that some of you were very familiar, but at a personal level. And what your experience and your backgrounds and where you come from have all this, your take on these different topics. Because what you are is made up from all your previous experiences. Uh, thank you for this time. And it, we couldn't ask all the questions that we, that we wanted to, but we're looking forward to, to continue this discussion of all relevant topics and continue with this webinar series. And now to close, I will give it to Aurelia. Additionally, I want to say a big thank you to my co-host, John marie Planco, and everybody behind the scenes who helped us to organize this event, especially Catherine Chirac. And of course, we want to thank everybody in the audience. This was a record event for CUSP with three-digit numbers of attendees. And we hope that you enjoyed the panel discussion, that you've learned something. I know that I have. And um, please look out for the upload to the SEG website and the SEG YouTube channel. Share this once it's uploaded and please join us for our future events. With this, um, we want to say thank you everybody. Take care, stay safe and join us for the next event. Bye-bye. <laughs>